Welcome to the Classy Thursday edition of the St. Mark's Spark. I'm glad that you all are with us this afternoon. As we begin this time together, let's say a word of prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the beauty of this earth. We thank you, Lord, that you are always with us. We pray, Lord, and this time that we might take a deep breath, breathe in the goodness that you give to us. May we see hope in the midst of despair. May we see light in the midst of darkness. May we see your truth in the midst of a world that so many times feels like a place of lies and a place of deception. Help us, God, to truly be open to your word. It is in your name we do pray, and all God's children said, Amen. <clears throat> so our scripture reading this day, for the, the daily lectionary, is from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. This is a story that is about healing and about wholeness, but it's really a lot about our conceptions or misconceptions about the world and how we interact with it and how God interacts and God acts in God's creation. So I'm going to invite you with open ears and a soft heart to listen as God speaks to us through God's word. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciple, disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When Jesus had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, no, but it's someone who looks like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how, how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and I washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God taught early on and at some point I still carry it with me like a birthmark or something that the world moves by cause and effect. We learned that in science, right? We're taught that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Even looking out at the world, we're told phrases like what goes around comes around. We're even told about things like karma and the idea that people are going to get what's coming to them. The scriptures even at times seem to validate this, seem to reinforce this saying things like, you reap what you sow. We hear that in, in Paul's letter in the Galatians, to the Galatian church. You reap what you sow. And many times this is true. We talk about this with our children, about natural consequences. You know, if you reach up and you touch a, a stove that's hot, you're gonna get burned if you uh, tell a lie. Eventually, things will be un, will begin to unravel, and and it's going to come back on us if if we are deceptive people or if we do things that cause harm to other people. That those things are going to come back to us at some point. And there are times certainly where that's true. It though is a fairly common world view. Lots of people hold on to it and hold up the idea that. When life is good, this is the way we look out at the world. To, uh, to quote the great philosopher from Caddyshack, Judge Smales, it's easy to grin when your ship comes in. It's easy to hold this idea that uh, bad things happen to bad people when things are going good for us. Remember a few weeks ago, we maybe last week, we were reading about Job and, and Job and, and how all these bad things befall him and his 
his friends were coming in trying to convince him to repent because clearly he had done something wrong that angered God and, and he needed to repent of his sins in order for these things to be lifted from him. The physical ailments, the economic perils, the, the uh, destruction of his livelihood and his family. It's easy to look out at the world and hold a world view of uh, what goes around comes around, of the cause and effect when things are going well for us, but we know the world is very rarely this black and white. We know this because there have been times in our own lives where we have been crushed, where we have been broken. Sometimes these are the natural consequences of our action. There is no doubt about that. Sometimes we cause harm to other people and we are harmed in the process. And sometimes bad things just happen. And sometimes the unexplainable goes on and we deal with suffering. Last week, Sam asked me uh, about any stories I knew where the bad guy wins. I started thinking about that, about stories, about books I've read where the bad guy wins. And I couldn't come up with one at the time or really thinking about it. But yeah, I look out at the world and it feels like this happens all the time. It feels like so many times that there are people, the psalmist says, and the psalmist writes about, that should be having uh, the experience a divine judgment against them, and yet nothing seems to happen. It feels like they get wealthier, their house gets bigger, they get more prosperity and more prosperous. It feels sometimes like the night keeps going. It feels like sometimes that some people who, who don't deserve it are suffering, while others that need to be not brought down a peg, that they are reveling in their poor behavior. And so we turn to today's story. It starts off with Jesus and the disciples, and there is a man who is born blind. And the disciples ask a very simple question, who sinned? Who sinned? Did his parents sin? Or perhaps did he commit some kind of sin in utero? some kind of sin before he was born that caused this to happen. Now this seems odd, you know, is he going to be punished for his parents' sins? You know, the scripture talks about that, that there is a punishment that will happen and, and certainly there, it feels like that sometimes in the world that that people are paying for the sins of, of the parents, the sins of the father. So was it the parents' sin or, or what, did he somehow commit a sin before he was born? The two-word question that still haunts us, who sinned? This is a very dangerous thing to do. It's a very dangerous thing to look at it, out at somebody who is experienced mis, experiencing misfortune and say, who sinned? Did you sin in order for this to befall you? Did you sin in order for you to, to have this great weight placed upon you? Did you sin? And is that why you have lost everything? There's a scene in a television show that came out probably about eight, nine, ten years ago called The Newsroom. It's actually in the, the first episode, and the main character, a, a newsman named Will, he goes on this rant, on this diatribe in the middle of a Q&A at a college campus, and, and he has a, a, a sentence here that has always stuck with me. He said, there was a time when we waged wars on poverty not poor people. There was a time when we, when we waged wars on poverty, not poor people. I look out at our world right now and, and so much of, we see the poverty in our inner cities and we see uh, the poverty in, in uh, rural communities. We see poverty all around us, deteriorating neighborhoods, crime that's rampant in the streets. We see the addiction the issues with addictions to opioids or to methamphetamines and and we we look out and we say who sinned who sinned was this your sin or was this the sin of your parents and i kind of sat in that quote is sat in this passage and and dwelled on it perhaps the biggest issue right now is not the poverty in the streets but it's the poverty in our spirits it's the poverty and how we look at these problems. 
in blaming the poor for their own poverty, blaming the battered for their own uh, abuse, blaming the victim in many cases. We can do this only from our own ivory towers. We can do this only from our own places of comfort and privilege. Harry Emerson Fostick recognized this a hundred years ago. Henry Harry Emerson Fostick, who was the, the great preacher in New York, but he penned these words, perhaps you'll recognize this song. Cure your children's warring madness. Bend our pride to your control. Shame our wanton selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss your kingdom's goal. Lest we miss your kingdom's goal. There's a lot of poverty out in the world. There's the poverty of people not being able to make ends meet. There's the, the poverty of, of children going throughout their days and going to bed hungry. There's the poverty of, of folks who have to make the choice between the electricity bill or paying for their medicine. But the poverty I want to talk about for the rest of our time together today is a poverty of imagination, a poverty of compassion and empathy, and a poverty of dreams. We settle for questions simple questions, wrong questions like who sinned? Who sinned? Was it this individual who was broken or was it the parents? Was it this individual who was born blind? This individual who had no chance ever to see? Or was it their parents? And Jesus in this passage, he says, nobody sinned. Nobody sinned. He's blind. But it's not just the way it is. It's not just one of those things that will never change. God can be glorified, Jesus says, in a transformative, miraculous moment. Jesus says, and this is one of Jesus' I am statements that we hear a lot in John. When Jesus says I am, it echoes back to the bush that burns but is not consumed in Exodus. The bush where God spoke to Moses, the bush when Moses said, who are you? And, and out of the bush came God's voice saying, I don't have a name. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. So when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, we hear the God revealing God's self on that mountain in the wilderness to Moses. When Jesus says, I am the true vine, when Jesus says here, I am the light of the world. Jesus is saying, I'm God. I am the one who brings light into the darkness. And the darkness does not overcome it. So Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But this man, this man was born blind. He literally has never seen the light of day before. Jesus is the light of the world. And he invites, he commands us to get involved. In this passage, Jesus says, we must do the work the works of him who sent me we must do the works of the one of god the father who sent jesus and then we get this incredible moment when jesus had said this he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes and he said to him go go wash in the pool of siloam which means sent. Then this man, he went and he washed and he came back able to see. Who sinned? Who sinned? Perhaps the better question, the question we need to wrestle with more today is who is still blind today? Is it me? Is it you? Is it all of us? Perhaps what we can glean from this passage is not about a, an actual physical loss of sight, but it is about a blindness in our hearts, a blindness in our spirits, and, and perhaps a blindness in our world view where we blame other people 
for their own sickness, for their own poverty, for their own infirmity. Perhaps we need Jesus again to take that dirt, that dirt that was present at creation, that dirt that God formed into Adam, that dirt, the Hebrew word Adama, that made humanity, that God takes that dirt, that God spits into that dirt and makes a mud and then places it, cakes it on and covers our own unseen eyes. And maybe in that we can hear Jesus say the same thing he said to this man, go, go and wash, go and wash in a pool called scent, go to the place called scent and wash up. It may be, maybe we can see God's creation. See our Father's world with a new set of eyes. Who sinned? It's far too easy of a question. Far too toxic of a question to really get at the heart of what God wants to do with us in the world today. The better question in this situation, in all situations, is how can God be glorified today? How can God be glorified in me today? But the first thing we need to do is have ears to hear, have hearts to feel, have eyes to see the world the way God wants us to see it, to see the world the way God sees it, and then have a willingness to go when Jesus sends us, to wash off these things and to move into the world with new eyes and with a new spirit. This is a powerful thing. The question of who sinned, well, the answer is always me. I have sinned. The psalmist reminds us, against you, you alone, have I sinned. God can still use sinful people. God can use imperfect people to accomplish God's perfect plan. But the first thing we have to acknowledge is that while we were once blind, we need to see. May God bless you this day and may God's spirit be with you. I pray God's blessings on you. Amen.